Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Applying Human Factors to Liability Cases. During today's program, our presenter will cover the following. What is human factors? Why is it important in the litigation field? How is human factors similar and different to other disciplines? Examples of the use of human factors in typical legal cases? And finally, examples of the use of human factors in special situations. The presenter for today's program is William Nelson. William has over 30 years of experience in ergonomics, biomechanics, and human factors principles. Will, Will's experience in, <clears throat> and areas of specialization include product liability, personal injury, premise liability, and accident reconstruction. He has been directly involved with the commercialization of emerging technologies, uh, among which include lasers, uh, electronics, medical devices, hand tools, and others. Of special interest to Mr. Nelson are the unintended consequences from the use of emerging technologies in today's multicultural society. Of particular interest is the emerging research in the areas of driver distraction, sports injuries, and medical errors, and how to help prevent injuries. Will has been a presenter at national and international conferences. He has over 18 years of litigation support experience as an expert witness throughout the United States, the municipal, state, and federal court, as well as experience with the Dahlberg hearing process. We will take two question and answer breaks during today's program. If you have a question, please use the chat feature or Q&A feature, which are located on the right-hand side of the screen, to submit your questions to the presenter. We encourage all attendees to submit the questions throughout the presentation. Tomorrow morning, I will send out a link uh, to the archive recording of this webinar. And we do ask that you take time to fill out the survey that will appear on your screen after today's program is over. Now, I invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. I'm going to turn the presentation over to our distinguished guest, Mr. William Nelson. Will, the program's all yours. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I appreciate uh, your introduction there and your uh, kind words. also appreciate uh, everybody that is online today and your time. I know that it's very uh, critical and that you have a lot going on in your lives. So uh, I wanted to cover a lot of material today. We have about 69 slides, uh, but the, uh, the topic, I think, is an important one. It seems that it's one that we get a lot of interest in, a lot of questions about what is human factors, uh, because it's not a classic uh, engineering type area that we generally get involved with. Uh, and it seems to be an area that raises a lot of questions uh, on the, in the litigation world. So uh, Matt and I talked about and thought that this would be a good session to kind of talk about an overview of it. We will not be going into a tremendous amount of depth because of the breadth of the material uh, that we will be covering today. Uh, there's Two of us uh, here at Human Tech that get involved with human factors, Mark Heiderbrecht and myself. Mark is actually out of town today on a site inspection out in California, so I'll be covering the entire presentation. But know that uh, both of us uh, are deeply involved in this area and uh, have been involved in putting together uh, the materials that you see today. Uh, also, like to uh, mention again uh, with Matt and Tassa, we've been working with Tassa for approximately 15 years and have had a great relationship with them. Matt has been extremely good to work with, and I'm sure at the end of this presentation, as he mentioned, he'll be following up with you on any uh, follow-up questions or the audio presentation. And if uh, you need the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation itself, uh, then uh, Matt will work that out with us on getting that to you also. Just to briefly go over what we'll be talking about today, Matt covered it in the, uh, the introduction, but. Uh, items one through six here about what is human factors, misconceptions, human factors, human error, types of error, and human factors models and the system approach. Those six will be covered in the first half uh, of the presentation. There'll be a short break for Q&A, and then the second half, I'm really wanting to dedicate two uh, case studies, which are uh, simplified cases that uh, we have been involved with that cover a variety of topics. Those topics include communications, warnings, medical errors, decision-making, uh, driver distraction, and perception. And uh, so we'll be talking about some real-world case studies uh, in, in these uh, areas today. 
So let's quickly uh, cover some of the basics here. What is human error? Human error is an action or decision that results in one or more unintended negative outcomes. There's many, many definitions, and uh, it seems like every author that comes out with a book has a different definition of it. I like this one because it's very simple and it deals with what we tend to deal with, which is real world situations, uh, as opposed to research or theoretical situations. Some of the assumptions that goes into uh, a lot of human factors analysis is that the simpler the task, the lower the likelihood that an error will be committed. Obviously, this is within reason due to such issues that we'll talk about a little bit of boredom, monotonous work, uh, things that uh, can actually lead to additional errors. Uh, but in general, that's a, a concept that is pretty true. The more people that are involved in performing a task, the greater the likelihood that an error will be committed. So consequently, as you get involved with very complex systems or systems that involve a lot of people, uh, errors occur. Uh, we're probably all familiar with when you were a child, uh, a line up in school and the first person in the line has something to say. They tell the second person, the second person repeats it to the third person, third person repeats it to the fourth person. And by the time it gets to the last person, it has nothing to do with what was said initially. A uh, classic example of communication error uh, and involving with the complexity of dealing with human beings in, in the process itself. And lastly, all errors cannot be eliminated, but opportunities for error can be reduced and their negative outcome can be minimized. Human factors involves uh, basically the interrelationship inter between machines and humans. And uh, there are things that machines are good at doing and there's things that humans are good at doing. Uh, this is evolving over time, obviously, with the uh, evolution of technology that uh, is incorporated into our everyday lives. But I thought it'd be good to kind of give just a general overview of some things that machines are good uh, with uh, as opposed to humans. Uh, one of those is obviously performing routine, repetitive, or very precise operations. And you can think of this as you know, going back to Henry Ford and uh, assembling the automobile where uh, took tasks and broke those down into very small tasks uh, and then had those done repetitively. At that time, they were all done with human beings. Where you look at today's automobile manufacturing, a lot of those repetitive tasks are all done by machines, except for those situations where a machine is just not capable of performing it. Another one has to do with uh, machines tend to be insensitive to extraneous factors. So, for example, uh, we're all familiar with this. You know, we have, as human beings, we have good days, bad days. We're affected by the weather. We have uh, home front issues that we deal with. Coming to work, you have construction delays, all types of things that can affect your efficiency, productivity, and uh, can create errors in the, in the workplace. So, obviously, uh, machines, from a general standpoint, don't have those to deal with. What are humans generally good at? <clears throat> One of those is sensitivity to a wide variety of stimuli. Uh, in other words, humans can take in information uh, from a wide variety of, of sources, process that information, and be able to distill that information down into making judgment decisions and a course of action. Now, granted, with robots and intelligent machines, uh, again, this is an area of emerging technology that is going to have uh, drastic effects, uh, uh, it already is, as well as more in the future, on that interrelationship between what humans are good at and what machines are good at. However, no matter what happens with technology, it always seems that all it does is shift what humans do. It doesn't really take away what humans do. So if you look at the evolution over the last 70, 80 years, a lot of the drudgery, a lot of the very difficult, uh, dirty, high, uh, hard work has been taken over by machines, and it allows people to do what they do best, as I mentioned earlier, which is to basically take in information, process that information, and make judgment decisions based off of that information. Uh, the word uh, best is in quotes because that evolves over time. What could be the best solution right now, that mix between humans and machines can evolve, again, based off of the technology. 
So now we come to what is human factors, and uh, as you'd probably guess from looking at the previous slides, it's the study of the interrelationship between humans, the tools they use, and the environment in which they live and work. A human factors approach is used to understand where and why systems or processes break down. And this approach examines the process of error, looking at the causes, circumstances, conditions, uh, associated procedures, devices, and other factors con connected with that event itself. The study in human performance can result in the creation of safer systems, uh, the reduction of conditions that can lead to errors. However, not all errors are related to human factors. Although equipment and materials uh, should take into account the design of the way people use them, human factors may not resolve, for example, instances of equipment breakdown or material failure itself. Those may not be related from a human factors standpoint. So much of the work in human factors is on improving the human system interface by designing better systems and processes. A closely related field that some of you may have, have heard of is ergonomics. And in the United States, the term uh, generally ergonomics and human factors is separated out, even though the uh, society is the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society uh, that uh, folks like myself belong to. Uh, generally, uh, human factors is more cognitive and decision making. Ergonomics tends to get more involved with the actual movement uh, and forces and kinetics and kinematics that are involved in the work that the person does. Uh, so a lot of times they're interrelated and used in concert when it uh, is looking at workplace injuries or uh, trying to determine causation of a uh, error in the um, uh, in the workplace. Now, a real common uh, theory that uh, has been used many, many times, but uh, today is really not considered a good theory, and that is what is commonly called the bad apple theory. And the premise of that is, is that complex systems are basically safe. They just need to be protected from unreliable people. So in other words, <clears throat> from a, a classical engineering standpoint, if you can just get the humans out of the process, everything will be fine because machines will work perfectly and they don't need humans to get involved. All humans do is end up causing problems and create an error and resulting in people getting hurt. Uh, we will talk about this in a little bit more detail of why the bad apple theory is really not uh, considered uh, the modern view of human factors today. A typical recommendation that would come out of the bad apple theory, as all of you I'm sure can relate to, is <clears throat> something goes wrong, they blame it on a human, somebody says we've got to make changes to keep that from happening again, so let's add some procedures or let's tighten up on the procedures that we already have. We just need to get these people to really uh, understand what we expect of them and get them to follow the rules and their policies and procedures, and that'll take care of it. Or a second uh, approach that uh, comes about is, you know, we just need to get rid of these people and let's introduce more technology and that will take care of it. Well, as we've talked earlier, and we'll talk more uh, in a few slides coming up, technology introduces its own issues relative to uh, solving human errors and, and the problems associated with it. And then thirdly is make sure that the bad apples do not contribute to the system breakdown again. So let's, those people who cause the problem, let's get rid of them, let's shift them and put them in a different area. Uh, all of these uh, recommendations generally don't work. They may make people feel good because, hey, we've taken care of, we've taken quick action, but in many cases, these recommendations are short-lived or they fail to really remove the underlying problem and cause and the errors just continue to happen over and over when uh, somebody new uh, is, replaces the person who was removed from that situation. Uh, a lot of times uh, this type of uh, recommendation is cheap and easy. Sometimes it actually is uh, face-saving uh, and it assumes that people can simply choose between making errors and not making them. So it basically says that it's really people just need to stay focused, uh, and if they really pay attention, errors won't happen. Um, so this is a very much of an oversimplification of the real human factors uh, issues that we face today. So one of the roles of human error is 
is is uh, really to try to look deeply into the process and understand why that human error occurred. So rather than blaming the individual, it's really starting at that point and trying to dig deeper and really understand what it is that resulted in that person making that judgment decision or making that decision with the information that they have at that time. And you'll see in the case studies that we talk about of how uh, very small decisions can lead to very catastrophic results uh, and they very uh, early on, you don't realize that those decisions can lead to that. They seem like they're very innocuous and very simple decisions that are made. And I think we can all relate to some things that have happened over the last decade of things that have occurred uh, throughout the world that uh, start off very small and end up very uh, tragic, whether it's a plane crash or whether it has to do with a failure of a building, bridge collapse, things like that. Okay, the law of unintended consequences, all of you uh, are probably familiar with that term. New technology solves one problem, but often creates new problems. Uh, the case for the electric car, uh, when the electric car first came out, pedestrians were getting hit by it because they're used to listening for the sound of a car coming and they didn't hear anything. So uh, it resulted in uh, two things. One is pedestrians have to become more aware of electric cars in their surroundings. The second was there uh, was it was looked at of adding some sound to an electric car so that people would know that it's in their vicinity and coming towards them. Um, another example is what uh, just happened today, where the state of California just approved the use of driverless vehicles on their roads for testing. As you may or may not be aware, Google's been testing vehicles with these capabilities. I can assure you that there will be unintended consequences of this technology revolution and how vehicles are operated. There will be things that will come out of uh, the use of uh, vehicles that uh, are driverless that sitting today we have no idea what those will be. Uh, the law of unintended consequences comes into play uh, in just about any new technology that is introduced. So uh, the effect is that uh, technology solves problems, but it also creates new problems. Uh, it can lead to initially under warning. In other words, when a new technology comes into being, we don't necessarily know what to warn about. Uh, it also can lead to over warning. Uh, over warning is giving too many warnings. Uh, we uh, have a product that uh, we've uh, been working on here on a case and involves a, a hunting tree stand where you sit up in the tree and uh, can shoot uh, as a hunter. And it has page after page after page of warnings. I think there's over 80 some warnings that are involved with that product. So that raises a question from a human factor standpoint, is the product inherently dangerous if it has this many warnings? Uh, is it possible that having that many warnings that anybody is going to read those warnings? So in other words, do the warnings become really ineffective? Or uh, is, is the product really a product that uh, needs to be uh, redesigned to try to eliminate those, the need for those warnings by designing it in a, safe, in a safer way? So uh, again, the, the product and the whole idea of warnings, and we'll talk about those uh, coming up, uh, over warning is, a, is an issue that you see uh, more and more as uh, warnings are added for various things that in the past you would just think that, well, most people will know that, we don't need to warn about it. Uh, and so we can, we'll talk a little bit about warnings and the effect that they have on people's uh, uh, actions or behavior. One example of technology and uh, the effects that it has is today's webinar. Uh, in uh, the past, obviously, uh, to do what we're doing today, uh, before the technology existed to do this over the internet and via the phone, uh, we would all have to go to a location. Well, uh, one of the biggest challenges that somebody like myself in giving a webinar today is I do not get any feedback directly from the participants who are listening. Uh, it's very similar uh, if any of you ever have uh, listened to actors that uh, talk about producing a movie versus uh, what it's like to be on a stage in front of a live audience. It's very similar to that for me in presenting today. I don't get that immediate feedback and cannot make adjustments on the fly based off of that feedback and looking at your faces and, and seeing the reaction that you have based off the information that is presented. So technology today, including this webinar, 
makes things a lot easier for us, allows you to stay in the comforts of your office, not have to travel, save a lot of money. But one of the unintended consequences of that is as a presenter, I don't get the immediate feedback in order to, be, to make the very best presentation possible on the fly and make adjustments as we go along due to the audience that I'm presenting to. The truth about multitasking, we all, uh, especially today's generation, uh, with all the different uh, things that are going on at the same time and the amount of information that is presented to us all at the same time, um, uh, it, it, there's some um, misunderstood uh, conclusions relative to multitasking and what the human is capable of doing. Uh, people cannot actually multitask. What is happening is that the brain handles tasks sequentially and it can juggle tasks very quickly between various tasks, uh, but it cannot do as some computers do today where they have parallel processors and actually can process information in parallel and bring it back together. So attention switching takes place, but that leads to a slower response and reaction time. We'll talk a little bit about that in a case study having to do with distracted driving coming up too. You may have heard of a, a term that 70% of uh, uh, accidents or incidents uh, are a result of human error. Uh, the 70% human contribution that you hear about occurs because complex systems need an overwhelming human contribution for their safety, as we've talked about previously. So human error is the inevitable byproduct of the pursuit of success in an imperfect, unstable, resource-constrained world. As we all know that there always is multiple constraints on us in the workplace, uh, there's only really three things that you can control, and that is uh, the, the time, the number of people, and the amount of money that you have uh, to use for a project. So those constraints are always being balanced, uh, and uh, as systems become more complex, uh, the pressure on those resources in order to maintain quality, maintain efficiency and productivity, but also to work in a safe environment, puts a lot of pressure on the system itself and leads to what the 70% uh, error that uh, you hear commonly thrown about. So the concept is that we need to understand the 70% or more contribution that makes the system success and results in a, a safe system overall. <clears throat> we talked about the role of technology earlier. One of the things that the role of technology does is it tends to make a system more opaque. In other words, it makes it a little bit more difficult to really get down to either the root cause or to the, the causes that led to that human error because it actually places uh, the machine between the work itself and the person, and the person in a lot of cases is overseeing the work that that machine is doing and monitoring that machine for its work. There tends to be with uh, technology and over-reliance on the accuracy of the technology. We tend to be uh, fall back that uh, if it's technology that um, you know, it's not fallible, it uh, tends to be uh, more accurate, more precise, uh, but it's very easy to get lulled into a false sense of security because that technology has worked 99% uh, of the time and we forget that we still have to be concerned with the 1% that that technology may fail and what happens if that technology fails in its application. So the types of human errors, there's four types that we'll talk about here. The two on, on this slide, active errors and latent errors. Active errors are those that uh, tend to be more immediate, those that uh, really are right in front of the operator. Those that are latent tend to be built into the system itself, either through poor design, faulty maintenance, bad management decisions, or poorly structured organization. Uh, as you can imagine, it's the latent errors that pose the greatest threat to safety in a complex system because they are often unrecognized and have the capacity to result in multiple types of active errors. Uh, latent errors tend to be removed from the direct control of the operator and include such things as it mentions a poor design or incorrect installation. Uh, uh, so consequently, latent errors take a lot more analysis, a lot more thought, a lot more detail, 
in order to uh, uncover those and to determine uh, how to prevent latent errors from creeping into the system and coming back to uh, result in uh, a bad incident at, at the end. Active errors tend to be the fight the fire, it's real quick, um, tend to be a little bit more on the surface, but don't necessarily prevent future errors. Other types are uh, errors of omission and commission. Errors of omission is failing to perform something, and commission is performing the wrong action. Okay, the purpose of human factors analysis, the basic premise of a human factors analysis is not to find where people went wrong. It is to understand why their assessments and actions made sense at the time. Again, that reiterates what we've talked about uh, previously. A system uh, is basically a set of interdependent elements interacting to achieve a common aim. So the elements may be both human and non-human, the equipment, the technology itself. So that's what makes up the, the system when we talk about it from a human factors perspective. Creating safer systems that are designed by taking into consideration characteristics of how people use machines to interact with each other in teams. In other words, as I mentioned earlier, the idea here is that to understand the interrelationship between the person and the system, and not just from the standpoint that it's the, always the person's fault for any type of an error that it results. So let's talk about the modern view of uh, of human error, that humans create safety in complex systems. Human error is not a cause of failure, but the effect or symptoms of deeper problems and issues. Consequently, uh, to say that it was a human error does not go far enough. It's really only the starting point. Complex systems are not basically safe. People have to create safety while negotiating multiple system goals. So again, the importance of the human in a complex system. Let's talk a little bit about accidents versus incidents. Um, we do not use the term accident in any of our work, mainly because from our standpoint, an accident is an event occurring by chance or from unknown causes. We think that the use of the term accident is almost a cop-out from the standpoint that it basically was not controllable, uh, there's nothing uh, that is responsible for that. We use the term incident as an occurrence that is a separate unit of experience. In other words, that incident itself, though, has a cause. What is the underlying principle? What is the underlying cause that resulted in that incident itself? Uh, uh, we've all heard of Murphy's Law. Well, this is a corollary. We'll talk just a little bit about this. What can go wrong usually goes right, but then we draw the wrong conclusions. And a good application of that is the next slide here, which basically shows that what happens in a lot of times with systems that involve humans and technology or machines is we tend to uh, change what is the norm, so we deviate from the norm. The uh, norm is the top line going horizontal. It says old norm. And what happens is we deviate from that, and, and what happens over time is instead of the becoming a deviation from the norm, because we've done it so often, it becomes the new norm. And slowly but surely, a degradation takes place, and we end up uh, with the new norm being so far down the scale that actually ends up in an incident and we then wonder why an incident took place and it's really a result that we were uh, accepted, accepting that things were going right so consequently there must not be a problem and as we talked earlier a latent problem is existing and it's just a matter of surfacing itself after a period of time. There are many different types of human factors approaches to looking at a issue. And I just want to talk uh, here of a couple of those, uh, critical incident analysis and a naturalistic decision making, 
won't go into uh, the other two, uh, but there's many more other theories or models that are used in, in looking at a problem. Uh, the first is critical incident analysis. Critical incident analysis examines a significant or pivotal, pivotal occurrence to understand where the system broke down, why the incident occurred, and the circumstances surrounding the incident. Analyzing critical incidents, whether or not the event actually leads to a bad outcome, provides an understanding of the conditions that produced an actual error or the risk of error in contributing factors. And granted, that's a long statement, but basically it's a process that we would go through looking at specific incidents, whether they actually ended in a bad result or not, but trying to take a critical eye and looking at those results uh, and trying to determine if something bad could happen as part of the process itself. A naturalistic decision making, this approach examines the way people make decisions in their natural work settings. So in other words, it considers all of the factors that are typically controlled for in a laboratory type evaluation, such as time pressure, noise, other distractions, insufficient information, and competing goals. But in this method, the researcher goes out with workers in the field such as with firefighters, with nurses, and observes them in practice and then walks them through to reconstruct various incidents themselves. So again, it, it's a much more real world application as opposed to a theory in a laboratory situation. Okay, we're gonna take just a real quick break here, about halfway through, covered a lot of material and I know is top level and a lot of information, but if there's any questions, uh, we'll take those right now. Okay, thanks, Will. Uh, we do have a couple questions in the queue, and I would encourage all attendees uh, to submit their questions. Um, well, we have a question here from David who asks, um, there's a situation where a worker performs a particular task over and over without injury, but then falls or hurts him or herself uh, during the same task, in a, um, and it was done in the same, same manner as it was uh, before. Um, what kind of things should attorneys be looking for, either during the investigation or, to, or discovery, to identify uh, particular human factors as a possible cause for the accident? Well, there, um, there could even be some ergonomic issues that are involved if it's uh, repetitive, because what can happen in a repetitive situation, you'd end up with cumulative trauma disorders or repetitive stress injury, uh, and so an injury could be related to that. Uh, sometimes, though, as a result of doing something over and over, muscles get fatigued, uh, as well as, as I mentioned earlier, you can have boredom, monotony can take place, and that can lead then to human error that could result in somebody getting injured, uh, more of an acute as opposed to uh, a chronic type situation. So those are uh, both could be uh, applied to that type of a situation in the workplace. Okay, great. We have a question here from Richard who asks, um, can you speak of systems with machines and technology? Can human factors analysis help if there are no machines or technology? Well, um, I'll rephrase that. I, I misread it. I said, uh, Richard asks, you speak of systems with machines and technology. Can human factors analysis help if, there, if these are absent, if there are no machines or technology in the workplace? Uh, Yes, uh, in a broad context, but when you think about it, uh, and technology is used in a very broad context from my perspective. In other words, if I'm using a pencil, that pencil is actually technology. It's helping me to communicate in some form or fashion. Uh, so when the, I use the term technology, I'm not necessarily referring to high technology or new technology or emerging technology. Uh, technology could be anything that has been created by humans in the process of what they're accomplishing. Uh, and there's very few things in this world that don't involve uh, some activity that includes both humans and some technology of some form or another. Uh, so I'd have to uh, know a specific situation in order to comment on that. Human factors, though, can look at humans and what they do and decide uh, and make decisions. So, uh, you know, if, if the decision is totally uh, self-contained with existing knowledge that's in the brain and the decision that is made with that, I guess that could be considered uh, a purely a human uh, um, 
um, you know, without a machine being involved or technology being involved. But even if you consider that, the knowledge that you have was probably acquired in some form or fashion uh, through technology, whether it's a textbook or publication or communication. Okay, great. Well, I don't see any other questions in the queue, and I know we have a lot of content to get to, so why don't you continue on with the presentation? Okay. So let's talk about warnings. Uh, some of you may uh, know some people who uh, should be wrapped up like this. Okay, so what is a warning? A warning is a uh, safety communication used to inform people about hazards so that undesirable consequences are avoided or minimized. There's many different kinds of warnings. You know, we've all seen these. I won't go into details, but uh, obviously there's all, all types, and uh, you know, I could go on and add uh, two more columns like this, the types of warnings. Some of the things that have to be taken into consideration when a warning uh, is uh, created uh, range anywhere from the font, the size, the color, the shape, all the way through looking at the, uh, the cultural aspects, uh, how explicit to make the information, the consequences of what happens if you don't follow the, uh, the warning, how concise to make it, whether there's any industry standards or government regulations. So a lot of factors go into making an effective warning. And to give you an example of what can happen with a real simple change, here's if we took a, a classic stop sign that we're all familiar with and been tested on when we first got our driver's license, and if all we did was change the color and say go instead of stop, um, basically because of the shape being the shape that it is and how we recognize that shape, that would create confusion uh, to just about every driver that came upon that uh, specific sign. So even though that's not a specific warning as such, as we're talking about, I just wanted to show a simple change and how that can lead to confusion uh, and how critical details can be in warnings in order for them to be effective. The four main purposes or functions of a warning, one is to communicate the important safety information. Second is to influence or modify uh, a person's behavior. And third is to reduce or prevent health problems, workplace accidents, personal injury, or property damage. And then lastly, to serve as a reminder to persons who may already know the information about the hazard. So let's look at a case study here. Uh, this is a situation where it's nighttime, a car breaks down on the interstate, it's summer, uh, the light level on the road is very low. Uh, the medium, uh, median width is uh, 58 inches. There's a concrete barrier height of 32 inches, and it was dark out. Uh, the occupants of the vehicle felt that it was unsafe to stay in the vehicle. They didn't want to get hit. So they exited the vehicle, climbed over the barrier to be safe while waiting for a tow truck. Lo and behold, the couple went missing, and a couple days later, the couple was found at the bottom of the bridge. They had jumped to their eventual death rather than to safety. The question is from the human factors, and obviously there's many questions that could be asked, but why did they jump to their death? Apparently not intentional. What happened from a human factors perspective? So if you look at it, and this is a case involving perception, I've listed here uh, factors that affect perception, and uh, every one of those, if you look at no overhead supporting structure, which uh, in, in a lot of people's mind is not a bridge if it doesn't have an overhead supporting structure. The shoulder appearance remained consistent. A lot of times bridges have different shoulder uh, situations. Little or no grade change. The billboard height that you see in the area was consistent. There was no illumination in the bridge no railing, trees and lights appeared to be the same height. So you go down the list, everything from a driver standpoint who was unfamiliar with the area, there was nothing to indicate that this was actually a bridge that they were on. And when you uh, uh, looked at it, uh, the space between the barriers gave the appearance of a solid structure. The barriers were approximately four feet apart, separating different directions of traffic. And what you had here is a situation where for uh, very little money that could have been designed out this hazard, so you wouldn't even have needed to warn against it. In fact, the original design of this bridge 
included a cap over this area that would have prevented uh, somebody from jumping to their death uh, unintentionally. Secondly, uh, if they uh, decided to cut back on the funding of uh, putting that cap there, they should have at least had a, a sign to warn about the dangers of a fall hazard if you jumped over uh, this barrier. Uh, and when uh, the course of uh, the deposition took place of the state uh, highway department that oversaw this bridge, they basically said that they did not see any need to create a situation that kept somebody from jumping to their death. They felt that that money would be better used for potholes as opposed to uh, preventing this type of situation from occurring. Even though there was uh, documentation that indicated that highway patrol officers had almost done the exact same thing as they were trying to uh, protect themselves from getting hit on the highway on this bridge that uh, was an interstate bridge. So uh, this is just a classic example of a situation where, you know, we're looking at it from a pure engineering standpoint, they're probably thinking, What's the likelihood that somebody's going to jump over a barrier but not realizing that cars break down at nighttime, you can't see, there's very little light. Every indication is that this is a regular roadbed as opposed to a bridge. Uh, and uh, with that situation, uh, the two people jumped to their death without knowing what they were um, ending up doing. Here's uh, one having to do with perception again dealing with steps. Background on this is it's a small indoor theater has seating on the floor made of the same material as the steps. Situation is that a person sitting on the floor or on the step gets up to leave and walks to the top of the steps to leave. The human factors issue that uh, is evaluated is can the person perceive that there is a step on the top surface itself? So in other words, they think that they're going to the top surface and then they will be walking uh, as they exit from the uh, the theater, and I'll show a picture here. This is what it looks like uh, as the person gets to the top. You can see from this that the, uh, the the flooring is the same material, the orientation is the same. There's no edge treatment on the uh, edge of the step, and the uh, the person that uh, was doing this was an elderly person. Uh, and you may be thinking, say, well, yeah, but you can still discern that there's a difference between the height and the level of the two surfaces. But what you probably don't realize is, when you look at the next slide here, you see that that is actually the distance of the step, and it's not really a step, it's actually a wall. So somebody is, is uh, not only surprised that there is a step, but then they're greatly surprised when they find out that there's not a step, it's actually a drop. And this is the importance of uh, having uh, something that discerns the edge of a step or the edge of a surface and not using the exact same materials oriented the same way. Uh, so a very simple solution that could have been implemented could have prevented a very tragic fall from taking place. Let's talk a little bit about distracted driving. 20% of crashes involve distraction of some type. <clears throat> um, I won't go through all these stats. As, as everyone is familiar, distracted driving is a big, big issue. There are many examples of distracted driving. Obviously, the texting is a huge issue right now, but there's many, many other things that uh, are considered distracted driving. Uh, most of us have been involved in many of these different activities of eating in the car, having children in the car, using the cell phone, uh, reading a map while you drive, all those are considered distracted driving. What happens is no matter the distraction, drivers who are distracted exhibit the same basic type of behavior. They basically fail to detect hazards properly. They react more slowly to the events, which decreases the margin of safety. There are three main categories of distractions. You have uh, internal to the driver, which could be fatigue, medication, illness, uh, drinking alcohol, focused on unrelated issues. The things that uh, are most common to us from a discussion standpoint has to do with external to the driver, but internal to the vehicle, the cell phone use, 
uh, texting, uh, and then external to the vehicle are other things such as bicycles, pedestrians, buildings, uh, roadside businesses, advertisements, billboards. All of those are factors that come into play from a distraction standpoint. And so there's three main types. You have the visual, the physical, and the cognitive. Uh, visual would be an example would be taking your eyes off the road. The physical is taking your hands off the wheel, for example, adjusting the radio. Uh, and then cognitive is taking your mind off what you're doing using a hands-free uh, cell phone device or uh, having a conversation, reading a billboard. Uh, put this slide in just to uh, really talk a little bit about uh, external distractions. Uh, one of the big issues that uh, has uh, been in the, the news a lot over the last couple of years has to do with digital billboards and the effect that those are having uh, and the effect that external distractions, just the amount of uh, distracting that goes on on today's highways and in the cities today. And then information processing. There's uh, any of you that have been involved with um, decision making by drivers is very familiar with the uh, the steps that you go through on detection, identification, decision, and response reaction. Won't go through those in uh, infinite detail, but that's a process that you go through in uh, evaluating a situation or, or uh, seeing a hazard and trying to decide what to do about that hazard. So let's look at a uh, case study here on decision making. Again, these are very simplified cases that uh, we've been involved with over the years. This uh, is a situation involving snowing, drifting, icing conditions on an interstate. Trucks were pulling over, slowing down to wait it out or to put on chains. A vehicle comes up over the crest of a hill and sees a truck stopped or moving slowly in the lane ahead. So the situation is, is that the vehicle is equipped with ABS, traction control, all-season tires, four-wheel drive. The driver elects to slam on the brakes, and as it becomes clear the vehicle will not stop in time, the driver applies the parking brake, which uh, they thought of as the emergency brake, and skids into the back of a semi-truck trailer. Shortly after the impact, another semi-truck can't stop and collides with a vehicle crushing it between the two trucks. So one of the human factors issues in this type of a scenario would be did the driver make the appropriate response to the situation by deciding to go straight ahead into the back of the truck, or were there other things from a decision-making standpoint that the driver could have done that might have actually uh, prevented the, uh, the collision and the incident from happening? So when you look at it from a basic human factors analysis and you understand that there's snow that is in the left lane, and with the technology that this vehicle has equipped with it, then you do the calculations, you find out that the driver had roughly 15 seconds to take corrective action, which is plenty of time to make not only uh, an initial corrective action, but if that didn't work, also time to make a second corrective action. And steering into the left lane in the snow would have created more traction than staying on the ice and would allow the driver to use some of the technology that the vehicle was equipped with that perhaps the driver was not uh, aware of how that technology could be used, even though he had it at his disposal. So the driver um, elected to go straight in to the, uh, the back of the truck in front. Obviously, the uh, shoulder lap belts and supplement restraint system of the airbags uh, prevented serious injury from that standpoint. However, uh, by being in that collision and with a truck coming over the hill behind, ended up crushing into the back of the, uh, that vehicle and getting smashed in between the two trucks. So the question would be, if it would have taken evasive action and tried to avoid the accident by going into the, the snow lane, would this whole situation have been prevented? This is another decision making looking at a private railroad crossing. Uh, in the Midwest, there are still a few private railroad crossings, which is basically uh, somebody going back many, many years had a crossing or had a, an entrance into their property or into their business. When the railroads came through, they were allowed to keep a private crossing that allowed them to come into, the, into their property. Well, this is a situation where 
an incident had occurred. There's two tracks. A truck was crossing after the first train went by and gets hit by the train and results in a death. Well, as a result of that, there was an agreement between the owner of the property and the, uh, the railroad to where uh, a flagman would, would be required to be there to monitor to make sure that a truck would not get hit by a second train that might be coming after the first train goes by. Well, um, as happens, uh, the, this truck was waiting for the train to pass. The train passes. The flagman says all clear, waves the truck on, and doesn't realize that the second train is coming. And before the flagman can get the truck to stop, the truck uh, gets hit by the train again. And something that's very unfortunate, the train actually hits the truck and flies it into the air and actually lands on the flagman and kills him. So the question is, should the truck driver have followed the flagman's signal without looking himself, or was the flagman the proper means to try to address the previous collision between a truck and the train? Because obviously uh, you have a human here doing a function that at many railroad crossings is done by a gate and flashing red lights. So when you look at it from a human factors analysis, the use of a flagman is an improper use of a human since the human is better at non-routine tasks. It is rare that a second train would be coming immediately after the first train passed at just the right time that the flagman would not see the second train until it was too late. So here you have a situation where you're relying on a human 99% of the time, if not greater, there is no second train that happens to be coming along at exactly that time resulting in a situation where the flagman is critical to preventing an injury. So the flagman uh, gets lulled into a belief that when the train passes, it's going to be clear. And over time, that new norm gets established that, yes, it's going to be clear and waves the truck on, uh, as we saw earlier, that that can lead to catastrophic uh, results from a latent standpoint. Second is the location of the flagman was also an issue since he was to be located on the side where the truck was stopped. But from that location, he could not see the very far, very far down the track to see the fast moving train coming in the opposite direction. So here you have again another misuse of, of a human. They have to be on the side of the track where the truck is, but then because of that, uh, can't see down the track because the train that is on the inside track prevents visibility of the train coming from the other direction. And lastly, the driver of the truck made an error in that even at public crossings where there are gates and flashing red lights, the driver of the vehicle should also stop, look, and listen. We're all taught that uh, to, to do that at railroad crossings and not just to trust the gate or the red light. So to totally rely on a flagman when it's the truck driver's life that is on the line is a poor decision by a truck driver to uh, totally rely on that flagman. Ironically, as I mentioned, it was the flagman who was killed and not the truck driver. Okay, and then uh, last year's medical errors. I wanted to actually uh, jump ahead a little bit because we're running real close on time. And I'd like to get to a uh, case study involving communication. So I'm going to jump ahead here a little bit. Okay, so let's talk about a communication error as an example. This is one that uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the term a chiller, but basically a chiller is nothing more than a system that makes something cold. It chills it down. So a chiller system was used in a food processing, was designed and installed by an engineering firm under a turnkey contract, which basically means as a turnkey that the company is responsible for all aspects, the design, engineering, installation, and the uh, sourcing of the, of the items, except for one item, the coolant. The, uh, the client had decided that they wanted to purchase the coolant to save money. And the client asked the salesman from the engineering firm what they needed. The client was sent general information with a handwritten note attached. And the note said, this is the info that I think was requested. I hope it's what you need. So the situation is that the client ordered the coolant without a key ingredient that resulted in rust in the system. They blame the engineering firm for providing the wrong information on the proper coolant to use in the system they designed. 
So the human factor issue, what type of human errors have been committed? Are the two words hope and think the same as providing specifications on what coolant to order? In other words, if somebody sends you something and says, I, I think this is what you want or I hope this is what you need, should you take that and run with it as that is what is being requested of you to, to go do? So in this situation, there are several types of errors that have been committed. Errors of commission, which as uh, we talked about are errors that you make by doing something. They use the wrong chemical neutralizer. They fail to flush the system properly. They ask the salesman for information, but not a specification for the coolant. So they interpreted hope and think as a directive and a specification. Uh, there are also many errors of omission. In other words, the uh, things that they failed to do, they failed to order the inhibitor which would have prevented the rust. They failed to send the specification to the coolant supplier. They failed to maintain the chiller system. They failed to train the staff properly, failed to inspect the coolant itself that they had ordered, and failed to check the concentration ratio of the coolant itself. And then they also have sequence errors and timing errors. So the reason I wanted to bring this up is we forget just how critical one word or two words can be in communication. Uh, and communication and getting across, especially from different disciplines that use different language, can be critical. So in this situation, you had an engineering group that says, no, we didn't provide you a specification. And you had a uh, client not knowing exactly what they were asking for, taking that information that was general in nature and thinking that they were actually being provided a specification of what to do. So that's the, uh, the end of what I have to cover today. Again, it's a tremendous amount of material and a lot of different topics, but I hope that it gave you some kind of appreciation of human factors from an overview standpoint. Uh, and uh, I'm sure, uh, again, if there's any questions that you have or follow up, uh, be sure and contact Matt, and we'll be sure to get those uh, questions addressed. And I'll turn it back over to Matt. Okay, great. Thank you, Will. And uh, for all who are in attendance, uh, if you have any questions for Will, we have about three minutes left uh, in the presentation. Please use the Q&A or chat feature found on the right-hand side of the screen to submit your questions, and we'll get them answered as quickly as we can. Will, just a, just a general question here. Um, you've been practicing human factors for a while. Are there any emerging trends that you're seeing within the human factors industry or how human factors is being used in litigation? that you'd like to share with uh, members of the audience? Yeah, I think you're seeing more and more that uh, uh, in the litigation world that people understand what human factors is and how it can play a very significant role. Uh, it's not uh, unusual that we get asked and engaged on a case involving maybe a classic engineering area, and then we, in the process of that, will pose questions from a human factor standpoint and the attorney then thinks, wow, that, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. That's something that definitely ought to be considered as part of looking at uh, causation and responsibility and accountability. So it's definitely a, an area that uh, we feel is um, more and more people are understanding of how human factors fit in. Uh, and again, I hope that maybe from these examples today, a case studies can give you some idea of the breadth uh, of where human factors fits into the uh, overall process of looking at a case and the merits of a case. Okay, question uh, from Scott here. Are the standards for human nature, and I believe he means human factors, standardized and accepted, or is the field uh, properly just a subjective evaluation of a human factors expert? No, I mean, it's a recognized science. Um, obviously, it's like in any science that there's uh, emerging knowledge that, that takes place. Uh, as I mentioned to you, that there's some real old school thinking, uh, the bad apple theory, but that goes way, way back, but that's not really a, a core of human factors. Uh, it's well accepted into the uh, legal process and the courts. Um, you know, it, it's definitely a science that uh, has peer review. It's been around in the United States uh, for many, many years. Uh, it goes back, uh, you know, World War II. It was uh, introduced uh, with uh, aviation as a key area of human factors. Uh, you know, we've done work for uh, Olympic athletes involving uh, human factors. We've done work for NASA involving human factors for astronauts. Um, so it's a well-accepted science. 
uh, and uh, an area that as new technology merges, it, it plays a, a bigger and more significant role. Any medical device that is developed uh, before it goes to the FDA has to have a human factors analysis done as part of that medical device. So any litigation that involves a medical device should ask for the human factors analysis that was done on that device, uh, which can come into play uh, real strongly relative to uh, causation and whether the uh, human factors analysis was done appropriately. Okay, great. Uh, thank you uh, to Will for putting together this great presentation, and thank you uh, for everyone who joined us today for taking an hour out of your busy schedule uh, to listen to the presentation. Just very briefly, I'd like to uh, wrap up today's program. Um, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to email me at mhide at tassinet.com. As Will mentioned, you'll get a follow-up email from me uh, today at about 3.30 thanking you um, Thank you for joining us today, and uh, tomorrow morning I will send out a link to the archived recording. If you would like a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, uh, please send an email uh, to me, and I will put you in touch with Will as quickly as I can. Um, otherwise, uh, I'd like to thank you again for taking time out of your schedule to join us, and uh, I look forward to seeing you at future TASA events. Thank you so much.